Uh, we have a few people in the hall, but maybe we'll uh, just go ahead and get started. Um, the agenda doesn't look too bad today, so um, hopefully May's agenda does look full, as, as you will see. So we'll shorten today's meeting in, in anticipation of a long meeting in May. Um, let's get started with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You want to, uh, Ms. Firestone, go ahead and start the roll call. I think people are going to drift in here. Yes, sir. Town of Ashland, Mr. Hodges. Here. Ms. Barnhart. Uh, Charles City County, Mr. Adkins. Mr. Coda. Uh, Bill Coda sitting in. Bill Coda sitting in. Thank you, Mr. Coda. Chesterfield County, Mr. Carroll. Here. Mr. Holland. Here. Mr. Winslow. Mr. Miller. Goochland County, Chair Lumpkins. Here. Ms. Lascolette. Hanover County, Mr. Davis. Mr. Peterson. Here. Ms. Pritchard. Henrico County, Ms. O'Bannon. Here. Mr. Thornton. Here. Mr. Brannon. New Kent County, Ms. Page. Here. Mr. Tiller. Mr. Evelyn. Powhatan County, Mr. Williams. Here. Ms. Carmack. City of Richmond, Mr. Addison. Ms. Jordan. Ms. Lynch. Dr. Newville. Here. Mr. Jones. Ms. Larson. Ms. Robertson. Capital Region Airport Commission, Mr. Rutledge. GRTC, Ms. Adams. Here. Ms. Torres. Here. RMTA, Ms. Dean. BDOT, Mr. Totten. Here. Mr. Riblet. Here. CTAC, Ms. Guthrie. Here. Ms. Erickson. DRPT, Ms. Dubrule. Ms. Dubinsky. Here. FHWA, Mr. Nelson. Mr. Rucker. FTA, Mr. Koenig. Ride Finders, Ms. Tisdale. Here. Ms. Ruffin. And Virginia Department of Aviation, Mr. Harrington. I think there's a roll call for attendance and we do have a quorum. Thank you, Ms. Firestone. Again, welcome everyone. Mr. Coda, can you hear me? Yes, sir, I can. Okay, our council has asked that we begin uh, starting to, even though I don't think Richmond has changed its status on the emergency um, situation that our council has suggested that we start uh, following the rule for remote location uh, requesting for participation. So if you could just uh, state state a reason that you're participating remotely and then I'll, I'll go through this uh, process um, that's required. Absolutely no problems, uh, Mr. Chairman. I am operating my own business, and so I am at that business as a, as I attend this meeting. Thank you, and thank you for joining us. Um, I'm going to approve your participation in conformance with our policy for remote participation. Um, our chair will entertain a motion from the policy board um, to approve that decision. I move so, we approve the decision. I move we approve the remote. Participation. Thank you, thank you, Mr. O'Bannon. Is there a second? And Mr. Carroll, thank you. Um, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Uh, opposed? Abstentions? Okay, thank you, Mr. Cotto. I'm glad you joined us. Uh, and there's no other, no other remote participants. Okay. All right. So next um, item is consideration of amendments to the meeting agenda. Does anybody have anything they wish to? Uh, bring to their attention regarding the agenda. I, I will, I'm going to make, it's not much of an amendment, but it's, it's on the agenda at the very end that our next meeting is May 4th. 
at 9.30 here. Um, in our executive committee meeting, we had some discussion. Uh, that is the same time as the visit to Kansas City, the chamber visit, and several people on this uh, policy board are going to be joining. So, and, and in fact, Mr. Mr. Parsons is, is going to be in Kansas City. So we were looking at moving the date. I think, it, I guess I said in the beginning, this is a, a full agenda, uh, several important things. And uh, I think we we're starting to feel a little uneasy about having such a high level of remote participation and, and counting on that remote participation as well. So May 18th, if folks could look at their calendars for May 18th, which is just two weeks later. Um, Mr. Lumpkins, um, at our last CTAC meeting, uh, there was interest from several of the members in participating in the policy board's next meeting. And, uh, and so I believe May 18th is their meeting. Is there an opportunity for us to have some joint activity at that meeting? Well, that was, that was part of, thank you for okay. speaking up. That was part of the consideration. We, we looked at May 18th and then uh, somebody in the executive committee said that might work out perfectly because I think you all meet at noon. Yes. Here. Yes. That's great. We'd love for you to join us. And, okay. And we'll, we, now it is a full agenda, but uh, we wanted, I mean, June is going to be another time where we can't do it. So okay. I, I, I think the consensus is let's not put it off. We've been wanting to okay. join. With, so we'll, we'll, we'll get that in that day as well. Okay. If, if you or many members can join us. Sure. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, would it be possible maybe for, for them to move their meeting up so that it is a joint meeting so that we don't have a gap between meetings? I think so. I mean, I'll check with, um, I don't know if, um, if that would be the official meeting. So we'll have to, I'll speak with Mr. Parsons about the feasibility of that. Yeah. All right. All right. So folks have looked at their phones and whatnot. Is there any strong objection to moving it to the 18th? Um, I don't know if we need to take a vote. I'm not hearing any objection, but let's just plan on that. Let's plan on, on uh, next month's meeting. It is going to be May 18th here. Um, so with that, we, we have an agenda, um, and we'll continue rolling along into... Mr. Chair. Yes, sir. I would, I would I, I think since we normally vote to approve our calendar every year, it would probably be appropriate to vote to change the particular... Uh, Meeting date, not trying to be a stickler. No, no, no. Well, I'll chair will entertain a motion. I would entertain that motion to change the May meeting to May. Make, make that motion. You're yes, making sir. that motion. Uh, what time? 9.30? 9 9.30 for the policy board. Right. I All would right. make that motion, sir. And the executive committee will meet that morning, same time. Yeah. Thank you. Is the motion on the floor? Is there a second? Second. Mr. Peterson, okay. We're going to formalize the, what we were discussing a moment ago. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Sure. All right. So, chair, chair's report. Are you, Mr. You ready, Mr. Peterson? I, I certainly am. Right. I don't have a whole lot to say, but I will. I will start this off. I really came looking to to do the highlight today, and I thought about all the things in Hanover County, but that would be an hour and a half to two hours. And, <laughs> so, so we decided instead we'd just focus on one particular uh, highlight that we have had here recently. And I will start by introducing that uh, this is Hanover Dash is what we we're talking about. Uh, and, and I want to introduce this by how it got started. I had a constituent in my district, uh, Mr. Ronnie Gales, who had some, uh, an illness resulted in amputation of one of his legs. He was scheduled for physical therapy at Sheltering Arms, about three miles away from his own. He practically never went. He has fixed income, and a ride, a specialized ride to get him there, cost him over $60 each way. Got me to thinking about it, and I said, you know, we need to have some other alternative for folks in this condition. One of the first places I started was right here with Plan RBA. Barbara J. Cox was involved in putting together a white paper for us to, to establish the need within Hanover County for this type of service. We went from there, once that was in, I used that. Our, 
our, my fellow colleagues and all realized, recognized our need. I then started talking to David Green with GRTC, who was uh, the director of GRTC at the time. And uh, he was very helpful, and I figured he knew as much about transit as anybody and was ready to work with Hanover. Uh, unfortunately, he then left and found uh, other avenues of service. And we had an interim that came in, uh, frankly spoke to this meeting and was talking about it. I asked the question in this meeting about working with GRTC to do something. And the interim, unfortunately, says, no, we're not going to do anything outside of our footprint. Well, at that meeting was also Jennifer Brule, who's now the director of Department of Rail and Public Transportation, uh, actually was sitting in Tiffany's seat at that time. And uh, she stopped me on the way out and says, let's talk to me offline. I did. She had some innovative ideas, which Tiffany was involved in helping with that as well. And for the rest of the story, I'm going to turn this over to our Director of Community Resources, Debbie Preston, and with her is Susan Richardson, who knows everything about Hanover Dash. <laughs> Debbie, Good. send your Good morning, everybody. Oh, I feel special. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. As Mr. Peterson said, my name is Debbie Preston. I'm the Director of Community Resources for Hanover County, and it's a pleasure to be here this morning to provide highlights about Hanover Dash Specialized Transportation. And it's a pleasure to see some familiar faces, too. Prior to Hanover County, I was the Manager of Aging and Disability Services for Chesterfield County. So That's I saw right. Mr. Carroll, Good to see you again. Mr. Holland, <laughs> yeah. um, and also uh, was at Powhatan in July. And I get to see Mr. Williams and Tiffany. So it's mm -hmm. a pleasure to be here. And of course, Ken Lance, um, I've known for years. So thank you. Um, so the Department of Community Resources provides direct management of Hanover Dash, which is a countywide specialized transportation program funded by a grant from DRPT, Section 5310, county funds, and a minimal copay by the rider to provide safe, affordable, and reliable transportation to seniors and persons with short-term and long-term disability. We are pleased to share that Hanover Dash completed its third full year of operation this past December which is remarkable considering um, it was launched in two months before the pandemic. And we had the, we are still, I hope, I don't even want to say it, but I hope we're out of the pandemic right now. But we've had those ups and downs, as I'm sure many of you have experienced in your own localities as well. Although the transport needs of individuals who utilize Hanover Dash are diverse, there are common benefits for accessing specialized transportation. These essential benefits include engagement, which accessible transportation provides a connection to community socialization and volunteer opportunities. Empowerment, accessible transportation provides older adults and persons with disabilities, a sense of autonomy and self-determination, and a sense of enrichment. Access enrichment, accessible transportation enhances one's quality of life by staying connected to family and friends and ability to pursue day-to-day -day activities. There is a continued need for Hanover Dash specialized transportation services within Hanover County to promote mobility equity due to the rural geographic barriers that result in lack of public transportation. Hanover Dash allows older persons and persons with disabilities the independence to age in place, especially more rural areas of the county. If you've been to Hanover County, it's beautiful. I'm proud to be a resident for over 25 years in Hanover. I live in a very rural eastern part of Hanover County, and there's rural western part, but we also have pockets of density as well in Mechanicsville and the Ashland area. Hanover Dash is critical to improving health outcomes for older adults and individuals with disabilities by providing reliable access to medical appointments, better employment, and education opportunities, improved connection with friends and families for social and recreational gatherings, and a consistent method for accessing basic daily needs to include grocery store, banking, pharmacy, and healthy food options. Hanover County is committed to the mission of Hanover Dash Specialized Transportation 
and recently incorporated Hanover Ditch into its strategic plan for fiscal year 2022 to fiscal year 2026. I would now like to introduce you to Susan Richards. Susan is our Senior Service Specialist and Hanover Dash Manager, who will now share with you a history of Hanover Dash, some highlights and challenges faced. Thank you for your time. Good morning, everyone. Um, all right, so I have a little presentation here. So this first slide is basically just detailing our vision, which is to provide an affordable and reliable countywide transportation option to increase access, reduce isolation, and promote independence for older adults and persons with disabilities. So again, the program began in December of 2019. Uh, we serve older adults age 65 and above and persons with disabilities. Um, we uh, travel anywhere within the Hanover County line and our service area extends seven miles outside of the county border. Um, which would include um, all of the major hospital networks in Richmond, like DCU, um, Henrico Doctors, and so forth. Um, we, even though it's just outside of that seven mile radius, we have identified Hunter Holmes McGuire Medical Center as an approved destination, as well as the medical offices at Stony Point. Um, eligible trip types are for medical, pharmacy, errands, formal social events, and employment. Uh, we operate from Monday through Saturday from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. and the cost is six dollars one way. So this is just a visual um, of our service area to kind of give you an idea of how far we go. Uh, it is, we do go a little bit into some of the other localities like King William and so forth, but that's kind of our footprint. So um, I have here some historical data. Um, again, beginning in, F, in FY20, um, we averaged the total rides, we had about 1,500 rides. Um, and up until last fiscal year, you can see we've skyrocketed to 12,367 rides. Um, so for 2023, we are projecting about 14,000 rides. And we also there have the cost there and the number of registered riders on that slide for, for your visual. So um, basically the largest usage of uh, Hanover Dash is most importantly medical. Folks use this to go to dialysis appointment, mm -hmm. physical therapy, um, any other um, occupational therapy, all of those different types of medical reasons. Um, employment is the second highest. We, we do have a number of um, disabled persons who have um, intellectual disabilities and developmental de uh, disabilities, and DASH allows them a greater sense of independence um, so that they can kind of transition into um, normal everyday life going back and forth to work. Um, <clears throat> Social activities would be um, anything from um, the local pickleball tournament um, to sometimes we have the, uh, the friendship cafes that Senior Connection sponsors. Um, and then we do have an annual event, uh, which is Finding Value in Your Prime. <laughs> and um, so those are all different places that Dash can take folks to. Um, <clears throat> pharmacy and errands kind of go hand in hand, so that's kind of why I put that little note there, um, because folks are taking the service to the grocery store and then also by the pharmacy or by the bank, you know, so that number can be interchanged. Um, <clears throat> so here is a visual, a heat map of our service, of our service, our riders, register riders, and as you can see, our biggest um, population is in Mechanicsville area, and then second to that is Ashland. Um, but we do and are reaching some of the outermost parts of the county, which is our intention, and um, we are working in increasing um, awareness and membership in those um, more rural parts of the county to get folks back to where, back and forth to where they'd like to go. Um, so we actually contract through Userve. Um, which is an adaptive transportation network company. Um, we, they actually employ drivers um, and contract with medical transport 
companies um, to provide the service. Um, so we work closely with them to make sure that folks get to where they need to be, but we contract through them to, um, to put DASH in place and have DASH act active. Um, USERV is it, and does uh, deliver safe and reliable and affordable on-demand trans paratransit. Um, <clears throat> they offer door-to-door -door rider assistance. Um, drivers must meet all FTA and contractual requirements. Um, <clears throat> they have a 98.4% on time rate with um, with a, within 15 minutes across all programs. So user also contracts with other places like uh, Chesterfield, and I do believe that they are talking with GRTC as well. So <clears throat> um, they have a dedicated project team, technology and call center. So DASH has a specific call center that is tailored towards servicing our riders needs and making their reservations and um, that is open seven days a week for folks to book rides. Um, <clears throat> and so um, basically, you know, it makes it, there's more efficiency and flexibility with a higher level of care by using um, contracting through user for, for our service. And so here are some of the highlights that we've had over the last completed fiscal year. Again, we began in 2019. Um, the total completed rides for last year was about 11,000. Um, we have 175 unique riders, meaning we have 175 people right now using the service to go different areas. Um, the total number of registered riders, I do believe, is at 263, but 175 of them are actively using the service every day. Um, in the last um, fiscal year, we did about 65,000 miles total. Our average trip mileage is 10.43. Um, and again, we have a 99% on-time percentage rate for DASH itself. Um, I know earlier I mentioned user has a 98% on-time rate, and that's across all of their programs, but specifically to DASH, it's 99%. Excuse me. Yes. Would you redefine for me unique rider? Okay, so when we say unique rider, so our population, our total aggregate amount of registered riders is like 263. I just added some yesterday. Um, and out of that 263, 175 of those riders are actively using the service day in and day out. Okay. So we do have some riders that are registered. A lot of our, a lot of times I will register folks uh, that um, anticipate having something because it does it is a process to get enrolled. Um, so it's better to be registered that way when you need the service you can um, just call in and, and reserve your ride. So does that right. does that answer your question? Okay. And um, twenty four percent of our rides are wheelchair accessible vehicles. Um, and then we have the average cost per ride for ambulatory folks. That would be folks that are uh, mobile and can get in and out, out of the vehicle on their own. The average ride for them is about twenty-five dollars, and the average ride, um, the average price of a ride for a wheelchair accessible vehicle is about fifty-one. Why is it different? Well, because it is. It costs a little bit more to have a van or a wheelchair accessible vehicle than it would to have a regular sedan. Oh, because Tenrico has a similar program through GRTC. There's no separate charge for wheelchair versus regular. Just one thing more. It could be offset by another cost, but typically it's going to cost you more to have a medical transport vehicle than it would just a regular ambulatory one. So oh, you mean a medical transport vehicle. You're saying that that's where you're lying down. Well, the medical transport companies are the companies that they do provide sedans and they also provide wheelchair accessible vans with lifts and ramps. Um, so that's kind of grouped into one and those are facilitated through companies and it does cost a little bit more than your average driver who is driving a regular sedan. Well, I just 
we worked with the taxi companies mm -hmm. and they started to buy vehicles that were wheelchair accessible, mm -hmm. just the regular taxi companies. Because they're also picking people up at the airport in yeah. regular yeah. rides. And they have made that commitment to to increase the number of vehicles they have. Yeah. So just but again, this was the program through GRTC, so I mean anybody can look at that. Well, we do collaborate a lot with the other um, mobility uh, providers in the area. We have the Virginia Air, um, Area for Mobility Managers group, okay. where a lot of um, us mobility managers will come together um, quarterly and share ideas and information, um, you know, uh, program specific information. Um, Dash is um, we can give a lot of thanks to Chesterfield County. Um, a lot of our program is somewhat modeled after Chesterfield's um, on-demand service. However, we've had to tailor it towards the needs of our riders in okay, here. This is him right there. We're talking about the <coughs> service, which is okay. yes, ma'am. Do you have a mobile app that can correspond with the dial-in? Or is it just calls? That is in the works right now. Um, USERV has been working to make it the most efficient and making sure that they add um, some accessibility for visually impaired persons. Um, we were last told that they expect to be able to roll that out by the end of the year for folks to use. But for right now, they do have you know the call center where folks can call it. <clears throat> so this last. Um, well, next to the last slide, I think, is um, just talking about some of the challenges that we've assessed. Um, you know, just constantly having to um, reassess the program parameters, um, what is eligible, where is an um, uh, eligible place to go, um, what do our riders need, um, where would, what would benefit them more, how could we expand the program. Um, to be more efficient and all inclusive, as well as how can we reach those outer parts, um, the more rural parts of Hanover County. Um, so what we began to do uh, recently is conduct what I call pulse checks. And so that's basically where I'll pull a number of rides over a week and um, I have a volunteer and her and I will call each rider to kind of assess what their ride was. Get, gather information and data so that we can kind of assess the level of service. Um, and then we also perform an annual survey where we will send a survey to every single rider. Um, I like to do those in person because again, our population of riders is a little bit sensitive, being of older, comprising of older adults and dis persons with disabilities. And sometimes just hearing a human voice and having someone to connect with mm -hmm. is another way for them to be able to socialize and um, feel important. Mm -hmm. um, so again, we have strategic marketing outreach um, efforts where we're trying to, again, make sure that we get out the word out about Dash to those other rural parts of the county. And um, we want to make sure that we're always providing service um, to older adults in a holistic manner um, that will help mitigate isolation and increase longevity and promote aging in place. Mm -hmm. So that is it. I know that was a lot. Do you yeah. have any questions? I, I, Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a comment. I, I think the 98% is remarkable. Anytime you're over 95, you, you, you're hitting out the park, in my opinion. So that's outstanding. And you answer my question, survey. Do you survey the uh, recipients periodically to see the level of service, the satisfaction of the service, and what can be improved with regard to the service. So you answer my question uh, annually, which is great. And what what do you what has been your findings based on your recent survey? Our most recent survey um, was <clears throat> overall um, most. I, don't have the figures off the top of my head. That's okay. Don't worry about this. But said. overall, they're satisfactory um, <clears throat> progress with Dash in the county. Our writers are grateful for that service, Good. and they do feel that it's an asset, allows them to be more independent, mm -hmm. um, especially those families where you have the sandwich 
the sandwich generation I call where they're taking care of their parents and also working and taking care of their own family. Um, this alleviates some of that pressure on those caregivers to where, you know, those <clears throat> older adults can use the service to go shopping or do whatever they need to do um, on a daily basis. Thank you. And Chesapeake program is entitled Access. And okay. that we have access. Yes. For. Thank you. For and we work well with uh, Chester Phillips. So thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I, I first I would like to thank Debbie and Susan for coming yeah. down and sharing this. But uh, one of the reasons I wanted to share this today is that, uh, yes, this is a very popular and successful uh, service that we're providing in Hanover, but it's not a totally Hanover. If it had not been for Plan RDA, the help we got here for DRPT, the people sitting around this table, mm -hmm. it would not exist. This is a good example of how we can work together within, mm -hmm. within the area. And it's all because of working together that Hanover now has this kind of support for our citizens. And thank you, Susan, for all you do to keep it operating so smoothly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Wayne. Are you leaving us? No, I'm getting up. I know you're going to miss my good comments. I'm going to say it. You don't have to leave. I'm going to be saying something good. I'd like to commend Hanover, in particular, Nova Peterson, for bringing forward this program. Not, not just to Hanover County, but this is a cookie cutter for the rest of the region. I've already requested and had Debbie and her team come out to Palatine, and we haven't given up on doing something analogous to what Hanover's done. Because what they did was creative. They, they took the 5310 funds and they did something different. I think y'all have actually made presentations to the American Planning Association and other entities about what you accomplished in Hanover County. Again, if you're in a rural jurisdiction, you don't have bay transit, you don't have any transportation other than a volunteer program of taking people to medical appointments or to shopping, to the pharmacy. This is an important thing that you need to consider. This, this is a way of going about it, but it's thinking outside the box, and I'll commend DRPT for their flexibility and being able to come forward with ways where you can come together to create transportation. And one of the things that I learned from my conversations with the folks uh, regarding the DASH program, there is no one transportation program that fits all the needs of a locality. It doesn't happen. In Hanover, you know, y'all have come together with different forms of transportation to meet the needs of the citizens in your locality. We're struggling in Palatine to do the same thing. But this should give you hope, <clears throat> give you rise to it is possible. Now, I'd like to ask Kenova just a couple of questions. Kenova, you're getting grants every year, I believe, from 5310 funds. That, that is correct, and, and the creativity that you're referring to, I give much of that credit to Tiffany Davinsky and Jennifer McGill. Absolutely. Now, what y'all are doing is you're putting in, you know, for these grants annually, and you're using that as part of the funding, or major part of the funding, to be able to contract out. You didn't buy a van or anything like that. You contracted out. That's where the innovation came, Mr. Williams, is that... Uh, and this was 5310 funds, to my understanding, had not been used, they had been used primarily for buying equipment, yes. and utility, until we started with Hanover Dash. And that's where I give a lot of credit to DRPT and looking outside the box at other ways to effectively improve uh, transportation and access other than just buying equipment. And you and your board, you made the decision that y'all were going to 
put money to this project to make it work yes. to, bring, to bring those trips down to six dollars yes so do you recall what it's costing y'all to be able to do that in Hanover County? And again, y'all are projected to do 14,000 trips. So. It, was, it was listed on me. It's like 700 and some thousand. Um, that do you have that, Susan? I see you're still here. Yeah, I want to buy it because I heard you. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the question? What, what, is, what is, is the, the county's contract? contribution? Um, it depends on the grant, the specific grant of funding, but I believe that right now with the 5310, it is 50, then 40, then 20. All right, something like that. 10. But then yes, 10. we did yes. commit that the county funds have to be to go along with, with the with the 5310. And, and I will say too that um, this past year, fiscal year 23, which we're currently in the federal fiscal year. We were able, when uh, we were working with Brittany Bull, we were able to use some of the ARPA funding as well, and it brought down the county requirement. Yes. It was significantly lower just this year, yes. but it's usually 20%. Yes. And did want to um, make a correction as well. When we said how many registered riders, Susan can elaborate. It's We have more than 200. Currently, we have over 600, almost so close to 700 yes. registered yes. riders, but the unique riders are the ones that yeah, use it smaller, routinely. A lot just registered just to be on the safe side in case yeah. they need it. <laughs> I hope that answers your question. So thank you, thank you for your presentation and thank you for what you've done because it serves as an example to all of us as what's possible. So we're deeply appreciative. We thank you as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank Ms. you. Ms. Yeah. Um, we, we've made or established the CBTA and I know a percentage of that money goes to GRTC. Um, I'm, and they're trying to do these short trips. Micro what is the trips. difference? Yeah, micro transit. Micro transit. Micro -transit. Yeah. What is the difference between this? Because the money's already coming in for this, uh -huh. the CVTA, to GRTC. And um, and RICO has Care on Demand, which is a very similar program, but it's done through GRTC. So. I'm a little bit surprised that you know the money from the CBTA can't can't go to this type of program. Or how is how is that different? How is it different? Uh, oh, I think it's well, great. I'm not. Let me just let's just say something. Something. you're opening up a discussion. That I think is going to take a long time, or could take a long time, and a lot of us have real interest in. It. Can you all feel that question that she just asked? Maybe I can, Mr. Chairman, okay. because I know we've gone way past our 10 minutes. Here. <laughs> but the, but the, the thing is, our, we're paratransit, microtransit does not, it's not limited to it's open the, to the, the elderly disabilities. Okay, because we have yeah. the, we've done it through care on demand, though. You can't expand care on demand, which is. You know, the paratrans, paratrans, yes. um, yeah, 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 let's keep, keep. So it's, it, there is much overlap. Um, so we will have uh, vehicles that should be able to fit a mobility device. So that is a requirement for the service. Um, I guess a big difference between the DASH program is they leave the boundary to be able to access like um, McGuire Hood, Wood, sorry, McGuire Homes, uh, Richmond Hospital, um, and other places like this. The, it is contained. But I think we are having or will have conversations with DRPT. There is, um, Tiffany was just telling me about co-mingling. Um, and we have talked to Hanover a bit about the 5310 funds and a way to maybe overlap that. Because you're right, we're actually using identified, we have the TRIP program, we've identified for demo, applied for demo grants as well. But um, we also are subsidizing that with ARPA funds. Um, Powhatan for, is one of them um, that we are identifying funds to go for that. But if there is a way to use 5310 to basically get to those hospitals, um, and still stay within the zone, we are looking at being able to do that. So there is a way to like basically leverage, get more for less money, um, kind of combining the funds. And because they're required to use the CBTA funds percentage-wise with GRTC. So the pilot will not be using any CBTA funds. We want to prove its worth before we go after what sort of operating funds that would support it. So we're applying for grants right now and then using ARPA to supplement. So after three years, we'll go after, we'll, we'll propose what kind of funds to support what, it. Would you applying for grants and using what supplement? ARPA. ARPA would really large. Mr. Chairman, if, if we could, I'd just like to suggest that topic for a future meeting. Uh, yeah, yeah, if we're going to have a discussion, that's definitely a future meeting. <laughs> I would like to. I would like to just piggyback on 
has comments and Canova's recommendation to have this as a topic on a future meeting, we need to have this discussion. Yeah. The, the fact that we're asking these questions at the table and the fact that we have these different types of transportation or no transportation in the rural communities, we need to have this discussion. And, and understand as a body what we are doing and what we aren't doing and where the gaps are. So that, that I'm going to second his motion to have this as part of a future agenda. I, I didn't hear discussion. a motion. I didn't hear a motion. Well, he, but, but, I'll make the motion. How about that? Well, I'll, I'll it's, make it's the a motion. given. It's a given. We're going to pick right. it up soon. Let's okay. Yeah. It's, it's I just want to know what happens if someone can't pay or can't afford to pay. Uh, that's one thing I have not heard. Discussion. <laughs> That's a future discussion. <laughs> okay, yes. okay, but I just want to throw that out. <clears throat> this is great, and I and I will tell you, just we we have concerns about these micro transit things. Uh, all of the jurisdictions do. To your point and Canova's point, having a discussion is good because even when you're just answering some questions and you're telling us all the things you're looking at, that's that's positive. I, I hear it's like so uh, so. Communication, which I know we all, that's why we gather, I think uh, that's going to be helpful. So, I mean, I mean whoever's. I've made a motion. Because <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't want this to just fade away over time. I think this is. So, the motion, so the motion is to. The motion well, is to have a discussion, have this as a discussion item on a future agenda. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you. All in favor? Aye. All right. All right. We got it. We're going to have the discussion. Thank you again, uh, Tova, and uh, your, for joining us and, and presenting. Um, and this was good. This was very topic specific, but I heard you say how beautiful Hanover is too. So you got the plug in for Hanover as well. So Absolutely. I know it, it is. I think Susan wanted to mention before we exit, um, she is participating in the micro transit study discussion. She has been with GRTC since a year ago. And I know there is, you know, a, G a pilot program starting in Ashland. Yes, which is within Hanover. Okay. Yeah. Good. So we, are talking, we are collaborating. Yeah, yeah. Very, very Thank germane you. topic. Thank you both. Thank Just you. want to make sure if there's any other questions. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll roll right along. Um, Sid, would you mind putting up some photos from the transportation uh, forum that we held last last uh, month, May seventeenth? Um, you you want to give us a little bit of the we had a survey. The survey you want to give us a little bit of a feedback that we received. Just a few highlights. Sure. Uh, we got about nineteen people that responded to the survey. Um, a lot of it was positive uh, responses. A lot of it, a lot of them enjoyed the forum, definitely want to attend the forum next year. Um, we had some favorite parts of the top um, forum, which was learning about Virginia sports, um, equity and inclusion, um, big ideas, Adrian Torres, um, um, so many interest, interesting transportation topics. Um, and then uh, some of the suggestions that people brought out were um, rail to be included in, in the future, uh, more experiences, stories from the public and people. Um, little more interact interactive uh, um, elements versus just kind of presenting and then um, some more hearing about more actions that be that can be taken to encourage um, more transportation and address concerns in uh, transportation that may be presenting a barrier um, progress report on 2023 topics just a few those sustainability and resiliency um, a lot of good good suggestions um, and good. Things to that, so good. yeah so we'll generally positive, positive feedback I, I thought it went well, I was just disappointed I didn't win the bike that GRTC put up. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that, thank you again for the generous donations and supporting it. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I want to say on my behalf as an elected official, that was one of the most cogent and informative conferences we've had relative to transportation. So I want to say kudos to you and all the person who put that together. It was really, I give it very high ranking, very high. Ranking. Well, thank you, kudos to, to Chamber RVA and, and Chet and the team that put it together. And, and to the executive committee, one of the things that we left is a cogent was your key word was, let's get out of there, you know, don't make it, you know, all day, all morning. And so I think that ended up being actually better than I thought. I thought it packed a lot in, but 
I thought it went smoothly. Uh, it didn't feel like it was overwhelming, even though we went boom, boom, boom. I thought, uh, so, I, but this wasn't so much. I wanted to hear feedback from the policy board. Do you all have any feedback? Those of you that were able to join us, give us some feedback so that uh, maybe we can keep in mind, you know, as we plan the next one, Mr. Hodges. Uh, just to echo a comment Ms. O'Bannon made earlier, uh, I hope in the future we record it and make it available virtually. There was another meeting held earlier in the week, Ms. Torres and others participated in transportation, uh, which is a virtual program. So I was able to access that. Uh, and I think there's a lot of larger, even larger audience out there who uh, have a virtual element. Any other thoughts? I thought it went extraordinarily well. Um, I, and I don't want to be redundant for the comments that were made already. It was diverse, it was succinct, I mean, really excellent presenters um, on point, um, the interaction, the attendance, the venue, all of it. So Definitely. I look forward to next year. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Great location. Mm -hmm. Great location. John, thank you for the decision. <coughs> thank you. Excellent location. All right, Mr. Chair, registration closed, so there were more people that would have participated had they been able to add more to the room capacity. So again, back to your virtual uh, suggestion, you know, there would have been more opportunity for public input had they been able to attend. So yeah, yeah. That's that's great when you you know oversell your uh, your event. So I think right. that there's a lot of interest out there. Absolutely good. Thank thank you all. All right, uh, we'll have public comment period. Anybody wishing to speak to the policy board? Present. Anybody online? We haven't had any requests. Okay. All right, rolling right along. Item five on the agenda. Uh, the chair will entertain a motion to approve our uh, policy board meeting minutes from our March 2nd meeting. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Second, Mr. Peterson. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Thank you. All right, consented consent agenda. Um, it has my name on there, but I think we're going to look to Mr. Parsons to give us the work status and financial report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Page 15 is the uh, work status and financial report for February of 23. Uh, I don't have any particular highlights of that. Uh, and then uh, the other item on the consent agenda is, uh, I guess, very apropos. This is the, uh, the current, or, I believe the window closed February in February, but the current pool of applicants for Section 5310 funds, uh, there are a list of five on page 25 of the agenda packet. Um, and the, the action requested here under the consent agenda is to endorse those applications to just provide the support that the TPO gives to, uh, to our, uh, our partners around the region that are, that are applying for those funds. Any questions on the consent agenda items? Move for approval, Mr. Chairman. Second. Okay. Holland. <clears throat> Thank you. There's a motion and a second. Any discussion on the consent agenda items? All right. We'll do a voice vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? And, and abstentions? That passes. All right. Rolling along into new business. This is a big item. The time of year for our unified planning work program. Um, it, uh, it's available in packet paper form and then it's uh, online as well. And uh, Mr. Parsons, if you will walk us through this important piece of new business. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I am sharing on the screen. Uh, I'm going to give a couple highlights of the, of the work program. This is something that we adopt every year uh, around this time uh, to basically outline the, the work task that, that staff of the TPO will be um, taking on for the, the next fiscal year. So starting July 1, uh, this, the, the work that we're talking about here will, will begin at that time. Uh, the Unified Planning Work Program, uh, or UPWP, uh, is the uh, discussion of the priorities facing the, the, the region. And um, through the Code of Federal Regulations, that's what I have on the screen, um, it, it outlines what the components of that work program should work program should contain, um, and highlighted on the screen are it, it needs to say who will perform the work, the schedule for how that will be done, 
the resulting products that should come from the work that, that staff undertakes and the TPO undertakes, uh, the proposed funding by the activity, uh, and then a summary of the total amounts of, of money and sources of federal and matching funds. So the work program does contain all of this, the, the draft that you have in front of you. Um, it, the outline of the work program, it, when I uh, began here, we, we took on the task of, of condensing the work program into something that's more readable and, and uh, might make more sense if a, a member of the public uh, were to look at it. So basically, it's, it's very straightforward. It, it gives an overview of the planning process that the TPO undertakes. Uh, it outlines the work priorities uh, for the year. Uh, it goes over the previous year accomplishments. So in a sense, this is also our, our annual report. Uh, so it'll talk about uh, what we were able to accomplish in the, the, the fiscal year uh, immediately ahead of this. It goes over the outline of the work tasks that have been identified for the, the uh, fiscal year in question, the staff resources that are necessary, how many staff do we anticipate are going to be needed uh, to undertake these efforts. And then finally, I guess the big item is, is the budget and how it's broken out in terms of the, the federal grants that are encumbered, uh, the different work tasks that have been identified for the year, et cetera, et cetera. So if we take a look at, at our current fiscal year 23, which is what we're operating under, uh, versus what we expect for next fiscal year, the total budget, you can see these numbers, they're very similar uh, in, in nature. Uh, current fiscal year is 3.35 million versus 3.43 uh, for next fiscal year. Uh, PL funding, uh, this is the federal highway um, planning funds are exactly the same. Uh, well, maybe at least on the, on the two decimal places, it's, it's exactly the same. Uh, the, the federal transit administration 5303 funding, which is also planning focused. Um, current fiscal year was, was 645,000 and change, and the next fiscal year is 659. So a very similar slight increase. Uh, I think the, the thing that highlights some of the differences in the program, and I'll, I'll give more information on this um, in, a, in a few slides, but for the current fiscal year, uh, we are operating with, with carryover funds uh, from our, our FTA grant, the 5303 funding. Uh, of about $330,000. And then uh, we have had uh, specific awards under the STBG um, for two projects in, uh, in fiscal year 23. The first is highlighted on the screen at 243,000 and change. That is for our scenario planning project. Uh, and then uh, the 200,000 is actually uh, additional funds from uh, previous years that continues to build our uh, travel demand model and uh, the, the tools that are available through that model. And um, that's something I'm actually going to highlight uh, in the, the upcoming fiscal year. So fiscal year 24, uh, we identify a, a little bit of an increase in 5303 carryover, uh, 442,000, and then uh, a, a, an anticipated STBG amount of 400,000, um, which I'll give more detail on that. So, but overall, in terms of fiscal year comparisons, very, very similar. In 24, uh, we've identified a number of focus areas. Uh, this screen identifies staff uh, selected focus areas that are, that are unique to our region. Uh, the first being our scenario planning project. Um, the funding for that, that project is broken out uh, between the two fiscal years. So uh, we've identified some additional funds for this fiscal year. We expect the project to continue through uh, all the way through uh, fiscal year 24 and into fiscal year 25. Um, so it reflects a, a, an increased amount uh, for the scenario planning project. We've also identified a, uh, a demand for technical assistance. Uh, we've started through this current fiscal year uh, working with a number of, of our uh, member localities to identify ways to provide more technical assistance, whether that's through grant support or uh, identifying funding uh, resources uh, through doing um, uh, some, some planning assistance. Uh, and and we're, we're starting that effort, but we expect to, to be able to continue that program uh, through the budget that's been outlined in the work program um, to support uh, member interests as, as we move forward. Uh, 
Um, transportation investments to capitalize on, on a number of different things, whether that's accessibility, uh, regional commerce, um, basically helping to, to, to match opportunities with the, the bipartisan infrastructure law. There's a lot of new programs that are out there uh, to provide some, some funding support. And we, we have the resources at a regional level to, to be able to provide that assistance. We don't look at expanding access to transit. I mean, a lot of the conversation this morning was about 5310 specific stuff, but also microtransit and other opportunities that the GRTC is undertaking. I think with the, the expanded uh, focus on not just the planning work, but the implementation that, that CBTA uh, provides uh, the capability to do, uh, it's a natural fit to expand that, that look at, at uh, providing more accessibility and, and assessing the needs uh, for transit expansion. And then uh, looking at strategies for further integrating performance measures. Uh, we've, we've leaned in really hard to using data to help with our project scoring methodology, not just in identifying projects for the long range plan, but for use by the CBTA, as well as, as other types of scoring methods, uh, evaluating projects that are gonna be included in the TIP. Um, we want to be able to look at continued performance measures that, that kind of expand that toolkit. Um, greenhouse gas emissions is something we, we do not model right now, but there are funding sources that are now available that are tied to being able to measure uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So that's, that's one thing that might fit into this category. Uh, in addition to the, the uh, staff selected uh, focus areas, the ones on the screen now are all um, planning focus areas that have been recommended by Federal Highways and Federal Transit. And uh, these all fit very nicely into the, the work tasks that have, have already been selected uh, for the current fiscal year, as well as the ones that we, we expect to continue for the, the next fiscal year. And just to highlight, uh, data management is, is an obvious um, uh, natural fit uh, for the staff here. Um, looking at equity and justice in public planning processes, we're expanding our, our public engagement practices and the ways that we interact with the community. I mean, part of moving to this location was to be more flexible and more available for, for the public and, and to provide opportunities for, for more interaction uh, when we're talking about regional planning efforts. Looking at the climate crisis and transition to clean energy, uh, there's a lot of uh, focus now on electric vehicles and, and uh, autonomous uh, navigation and, and those types of things. There is federal money uh, tied to those those types of efforts. Public engagement, um, providing a, a planning environmental linkages, essentially what are the steps necessary to get up to that uh, the construction cycle, uh, pre NEPA uh, analysis. Uh, we're actually doing work of, of that nature with with GRTC right now, looking at expanding the BRT um, to the west. Uh, and then safe streets, uh, again, more funding identified for those types of efforts. And in particular, uh, <clears throat> the UPWP right now uh, has language in it that uh, ties uh, to the bipartisan, bipartisan infrastructure law requirement that MPOs commit no less than two and a half percent of, of uh, allocated PL funds for work specific to complete streets. Um, the language there uh, is, uh, is still being developed. Um, MPOs are, are handling this, this requirement in, in many different ways. Right now, the draft work program, uh, we've gone through and included the language that you see at the bottom of the screen uh, for those work tasks that are specific uh, to work that might include complete streets language, whether that's long range transportation planning, um, uh, transportation improvement program, uh, active transportation, uh, even transit, I think, has, has this language included. So we wanted to provide enough of a, of a resource to say that we understand the requirement and we expect that the work task will, will uh, satisfy those needs. Uh, we do, uh, in working with VDOT uh, and, and DRPT, we're, we're, this is a dynamic document. Um, the work program can be amended if those those requirements uh, for the two and a half percent change or, or more clarity is provided at some point um, from our state and federal partners. So 
At this point, uh, the recommendation is, is what's included in the draft to, to include the language that's on the screen. And I just have a few more slides. Uh, the project tasks uh, that are in the work program, and this is just a, a screenshot of what's in the, the actual document. It's broken out into four general categories, uh, program support and administration, general development and comprehensive planning, long range transportation planning, and short range <coughs> transportation planning. The work tasks themselves do not change uh, from what is uh, currently in the work program for the, the current fiscal year. Uh, they include all of the, the things that you would expect, uh, the long range transportation plan, scenario planning, uh, transit, active transportation, uh, financial programming and, and, and tip work, rail freight and intermodal, uh, public engagement, um, and then uh, managing the work program and uh, the general uh, program in the house. And then if you look at those four general categories in terms of uh, distribution, the majority of that is in long range transportation planning, almost 60%. Uh, equity and outreach and comprehensive planning is about 19%. Short range transportation planning focused on uh, the tip and and a lot of the work that we're doing now is 14% and then administration is, is about 8%. So the majority of the work is in what I feel is, is the focus area, which is long range transportation planning. That's what we do as a, as a TPO. The budget itself is, uh, is developed according to the the, the initial outline that was presented in the Code of Federal Regulations. Uh, down the, uh, the left-hand side, you see each work task that's identified from program management all the way through to rail and freight. And then uh, the two main categories of PL and 5303 funds are how our, uh, our budget is, is, uh, is mostly set up. Um, and you can see a total PL fund broken out federal, state, and local. Of uh, uh, just over 1.9 million uh, for FY24, 5303 funds uh, in a similar fashion, a total of 659,000, a little bit more. And then um, to the right side, uh, the carryover funds from the 5303 amount, and then uh, expected STBG awards are, are listed there. And I did want to provide a, a little bit of uh, clarity on those two columns. The 5303 carryover, uh, we are anticipating splitting that between two categories. Uh, the first is shown at $342 million or $1,000. Uh, we would like to, we have never had this before, uh, we would like to develop a transit specific uh, travel demand model, uh, which is, is a new effort, but we think that we are at a point now with, with being able to, to predict the needs and anticipate future needs that having a, a transit specific model is, is something that is uh, we're in the right place to do that and I think it'll provide a lot of opportunities to to better plan for for regional uh, public transportation uh, the other uh, uh, the hundred thousand that's, that's listed there uh, we anticipate being able to work directly with with Ms. Adams and, and her staff at GRTC to identify um, either uh, immediate consultant uh, supported projects that, that might be covered under that category, or we are even allowed to, to offer direct salary support um, to, to GRTC uh, to say so that we can continue to make sure that the operations are, are, um, are, are, are serving as, as needed and, and make sure that things move forward. Um, the carryover funds is, is the, adequate, the, the, uh, the proper place to, to do this type of thing. And um, the, the staff recommendation is, is to work through those, those funds in that way. The SCBG funds, which are listed at $400,000, are to um, provide for the, the completion of the scenario planning project. Uh, we do have a, a consultant on board, and they've been underway for um, about six months. Uh, the initial amount in the current fiscal year of 243000 covered the the onboarding and the, and the beginning of that process and uh, the, the amount listed here will will be able to close out that contract uh, in, in FY25. So, um, Mr. Chair, that's the uh, that's the extent of the, the overview on the on the work program. I think in terms of timing, uh, we are requesting that that the policy board approve the work program today, knowing that it is a dynamic um, 
guide and, and can be amended uh, as needed from time to time. Uh, there are many uh, previous years where the work program has been adjusted mid-cycle uh, to account for changes in focus or, or new opportunities that have, that have arisen. So we think that that could certainly certainly apply if needed for this, this today. Uh, the May meeting is a full schedule um, and we wanted to put this, since it is uh, ready, we wanted to put this in front of you today. Um, we also know that this nests inside of the Plan RVA Commission budget, uh, which has to be adopted by the end of May. So uh, having this with, with some clarity on it will help to, to achieve the, the, the mission of, of the overall agency budget um, for, for adoption at, at its May meeting. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions or provide more clarity. Well, let's, the chair will entertain a motion. So moved, Mr. Chair. I, I, I got a question. We're, we're going to have a discussion. Okay. There's a lot, a lot of questions Second. in discussion. I made, I made a motion to approve. Mo motion to approve. I, I wanted to hear the rest of the motion. Yeah, motion to approve is unified. Okay. Yeah, Thank you, Mr. Holland. Doc, Dr. Newville seconded it. Okay. Okay. Now, now lots of discussion. Um, just thought we'd get that on, get that on the floor first. Mr. Williams. On page 25. You uh, just briefly talk about develop and implement a full transit demand model to complement the existing travel demand. Uh, I guess that's model. Yes, sir. I thought we had that capability already. We do not. Uh, we, we have limited capacity with our existing travel demand model, but it's really a matter of the current model does not, uh, it equates um, in, in a very rough fashion, it, it equates uh, transit needs to the single occupant vehicle, to, to cars. So there is a, I think there is a conversion tool to, to you know, equate a bus to, to what the car capacity on a, on a regular road would be. But it doesn't give us the opportunity to to really look comprehensively at transit operations and how it, because you know the, the the two things do not do not operate the same way. So this gives us an opportunity to to better plan for for network expansion, whether that's like a fixed route service or other types of things, which just do not apply to a a car focused model. Okay, let me follow up on my question about May, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Because I can remember years previous, we had in the long range transportation plan something that looked like a cardiogram of the region, where we had levels of service and where it wasn't acceptable levels of service. And of course, that's changed what's acceptable back then, what's acceptable today. It was in red or different colors of red. That's why I called it a cardiogram. How did you come up with that if you have these deficiencies in your travel demand model today, where you were only taking into account passenger vehicles and not heavy trucks, for example, which impact level of service on roads. How do, you, how do you do in transportation projections when you only got one piece of the transportation that you're inputting into your model? Thank you very much. I, and I, I, I misspoke. I, didn't, I shouldn't have said single occupant vehicle. It's, it's transit operations versus everything else. So heavy trucks, um, freight, those things are included in the travel demand model. And level of service, like you're talking about, is is the congestion of the highways. It's the comfort of the right of the driver. And and delay, time delay, lots of different things. Yeah. Uh, that, that factor into that. So it's it's um, heavy trucks operate in a very similar fashion to cars. I'm not going. I'm not going to. Yeah, cars. I'll give with you later. But I'm I'm really interested in what it is that we have in the system today with its capabilities and what are the inputs versus what do you propose to do going forward to enhance or whatever fill in whatever gaps you have in the model today with something else. I, but I can have that conversation with you. Absolutely. And and I, the intent is not to replace anything. It's to build an additional yeah yeah. Complement. Yeah, I just need to understand what that is. Mr. Hutton, um, recognizing there's a motion on the floor. Yes, sir. Um, I would respectfully request on page 35, um, the pass to 7430 rail freight and mobile planning. The focus 
uh, is pretty clearly on economic efficiency, movement of goods. I would hope we could uh, add to the purpose, moving people and goods, add the term safely and efficiently with environmentally uh, beneficial impacts. Mm -hmm. um, yes, and that there is some other language under method where they refer to performance. Hopefully it could say safe and efficient, wherever it says <clears throat> performance. That would give me a, or give uh, the town more comfort and hopefully the region. We had a presentation last uh, uh, month uh, from Mr. Brule in which I asked about rail safety and that doesn't apparently come under their uh, purview and I was referred to the State Corporation Commission. State Corporation Commission only focuses on rail uh, passenger safety. That leaves a sort of void in the safety area uh, for uh, free. And with the state rail plan emphasizing the um, movement of freight, taking uh, freight or truck carrying freight, taking that and moving it to rail, um, that, that's a future issue that I hope uh, is given more attention. So my request would be the language. Agreed. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. So Thank you. Can, you want to just summarize what you captured. You, Jeff, you were making notes, so could you summarize what you captured, and then if we'll take a friendly, friendly amendment, yes, and, and if the second person that seconded, if you want to just give us a quick summary of what you captured. Yes, sir. So under the purpose, uh, the the recommendation was to add the words safely and yes. between goods and efficiently. So it'd be moving people and goods safely and efficiently with environmentally beneficial impacts. And then the first paragraph under method. The last sentence in that paragraph, starting with the word by, uh, and we will add by ensuring the continued safe and efficient performance of the regional transportation system. Yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Holland already in the you accept yep. it? Accept Appreciate it. Okay. Yeah. I, think we're, I think we're there, Mr. Hodges. That's been incorporated into the uh, amended motion. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? I have a, a couple of questions. What's a, what's this? This reflects this budget. The budget thing that you had had on the slide a moment ago. That that reflects um, funding for how many of the staff here, or all of the staff here? Great question. So uh, the the commission, I believe, has about twenty six employees, maybe twenty seven uh, on staff, and uh, roughly twelve of those employees are full time transportation. Uh, focused for the TPO. So um, the, the UPWP uh, covers the, the salaries of, of those employees that receive the, uh, the support of the, the PL and 5303. And going into this budget year, you already know that you have more money than, than you're, you're paying staff right now. In other words, you have openings. You could fill positions. We do. We actually have, I think it's two openings um, that are programmed into the budget um, because we have been given um, to go ahead to, to hire into this position. So that is that is the, the, uh, so the intent. The budget has about room for two positions as you could fill in the fiscal year. Yes, sir. What's a mechanism that you use to track time? Because it sounds like folks, they, they, and you have a slide that had circles like 60%, 14%, 8% administration. What's the mechanism that that are those employees are paid under the under this these funds? What's a mechanism for them to track their time, and for uh, presumably you to monitor? Well, we have we have timesheets. I mean, we, we use paper paper timesheets. No, they're they're digital now. We've gone uh, online through the uh, through the pandemic. We provide semester time so online. So you kind so of mo we use... monitor that we're tracking what we're planning or how, how the money's. Yes, sir. The the budget is built on on um, work hours. Um, and uh, we've used the, the expended time for the current fiscal year, as well as previous fiscal years, but it's based on, on um, the, the, the position, the, the hours that they put into a project, and then what we expect. I mean, it, it, it's all built on the work tasks for the next fiscal year. So we use, we use those expected needs to identify the hours, and that, that translates out to the budget. Mr. Thornhill, I'll get you. Let me find one follow-up question, and then I'll, I'll So. 
one of the slides talked about the two and a half percent um, funds for complete complete streets. And I noticed that's planning. It's a plan. So two and a half percent of the planning money. Correct. So, so that just I have, I have a more important question following up how that translates into actual projects. But two and a half percent needs to be set for, for planning for complete streets. How, how is a practical matter to somebody if I'm doing some sort of planning for complete? How do I allocate the time? How do I allocate that my time on this planning project to complete streets? That's that's a great question. That's that's why we took the approach we did to include a general language in a couple different work tests. Because if you're talking about active transportation, if we're working on you know planning for the fall line, it's going to be more difficult for staff to peel off a complete streets focus um, into a separate work task. Right. So we expect that that through the different tasks that we've identified that, that complete streets work will be way more than two and a half percent of the PL funds. Um, so uh, we are hopeful and, and we'll continue to work with VDOT as, as more clarity is provided that that um, that the language that we have in the work program as as uh, recommended today will will provide that coverage for that really specific so, so Congress or the or the regulators that are implementing this have given us two and a half percent needs to the BL funds need to go to complete streets Correct. on planning side is that anywhere translated to two and a half percent or X number of money needs to be done on actual um, projects no sir everything we're talking about today is planning planning and there's no there's no comparable thing so much of spending money has to be done on okay if it is, it's it's outside. It's of outside. Of, it's outside. Of <laughs> thank, thank you for that. And thank you, Mr. Thorne. I, I, I helped you up with. Austin, I, I don't have a problem with the budget per se, but I do think, uh, Jermaine, to some of us, at least to me, that it would be efficacious in the future. Um, and we talk a little bit more about diversity. We talk about staffing and how we're putting things in place. But we don't share much about diversity. I think that would be very efficacious and helpful to me. All right. If there's no other discussion, uh, roll call vote for this. <clears throat> Mr. Hodges. Aye. Mr. Coda. Mr. Cotto? Aye. Thank you. Aye. Thank you. I have it. Mr. Carroll? Aye. Mr. Holland? Aye. Chair Lumpkins? Aye. Mr. Peterson? Aye. Ms. O'Bannon? Aye. Mr. Thornton? Aye. Ms. Page? Aye. Mr. Williams? Aye. Mr. Addison? Aye. Dr. Newbill? Aye. Second. Oops. Ms. Adams? Aye. And Mr. Todd? Aye. Thank you. Is that motion carries? Thank you. All right. That was our last action item of the day, but don't go anywhere. We have a a few more things to roll through. Scenario planning overview. Um, this has been, and it sounds like from what you said a little bit ago on that, that you're already six months in on the on the consultants' uh, yes, efforts on this one. So, if you'd give us an update on where you where what we've done and where we're going, that would, that would be appreciated. Thank you very much. Uh, I just have a few slides to to provide an overview of this process. Um, this is a project. Uh, the concept of scenario planning is something that is is one of those work priorities that's been recommended by Federal Highway Federal Trans Administration, um, and it's included in the work program. So um, this is uh, a new way of thinking about about growth and development that expands the scope beyond just transportation um, to all of the things that that connect. So. Um, in general, uh, if we're thinking about long range planning, what we do at the TPO is 20 years, right? I mean, most of the work we do is thinking about way out in the future. So there are going to be enough things that are unknown um, 20 years from now 
in regards to transportation, land use, economics, other regional dynamics, um, that it's really hard to reliably predict what's going to happen. So the concept of scenario planning is one where we look at a range of plausible futures. Uh, if we're developing a comprehensive plan for, say, Henrico County, uh, the, the traditional process is we develop a vision statement, goals and objectives, and the strategies, like the, the hard and fast things that can be used to, to achieve those goals and objectives and, and reach toward the vision. But what happens if there are five visions um, that could change depending on the conditions at the time? What if uh, sea level rise is, is way more dramatic in 10 years than, than is anticipated? What if um, the, the economics of the region um, change? What if we have a, an additional um, high-speed rail corridor that, that is, is, is popped in our lap and, and the, the development patterns change because of that high-speed rail? Uh, what if Amazon builds their new headquarters in Richmond? All those things could be uh, very impactful in the future. Um, so what we want to do is think about things in, in what we've identified as four, four unique buckets, community, technology, economy, and resiliency. And those are big words that have lots of different meanings underneath of them. But the, the overall purpose of this project is to be prepared. So um, as we've started the process, uh, the consultants had a great great uh, metaphor. Think about this like a defensive playbook. If you follow sports at all, um, the coaches on the sideline are going to have a playbook for the defense to, uh, they don't know what the offense is going to be putting on the field, but you hope that your, your defense is prepared and you have lots of different plays that you can call to, to meet those, that uncertainty when you get on the field. So the idea here is to develop that defensive playbook so that the recommendations on the pathway forward that, that the TPO chooses, that um, Greater Richmond Partnership chooses, that City of Richmond chooses, all are more reliable and sustainable uh, that could meet more of the, the uncertainty in the future. Uh, to add another metaphor to the process, think about it like a dartboard. Um, in a traditional planning process, you're throwing one dart and that's your future possibility. But what if, what if there are five darts? What if there are 10 darts? So uh, this process looks at a range of possible futures so that we can understand what could happen rather than just focusing on one thing. Think, of, think about it like a, like a flow chart, uh, starting from left to right. The region today, uh, we have one, one idea of what the region today is. We know what the region is today because of the data that's out there, the, the census, the uh, existing travel patterns, the, the congestion, all of those things that, that, are, that we can measure uh, immediately. But then we think about possible forces of future change, whether that's uh, environment or economics or housing or other types of things. We can look at multiple future scenarios. Our project is looking at 2050 because that also happens to be the next year of the long range transportation plan. So uh, we would then develop a series of models that aren't currently in place that could help us to get an understanding of, well, if, if X happened in the future, run these conditions through the model, this is what would be the result. If Y happened in the future, do the same kind of thing. So then we can test all of these different future conditions and then be better informed so that you all have an opportunity to, around this table, as well as back uh, at your at your um, supervisor's meeting or, or council meeting or in other organizations you're part of have the data available to make a better informed decision on on what might need to happen so as we've started this process the the focus area for for this is to look at the things that are going to probably cause the most volatility in the future the most uncertain and the highest impact because otherwise you're looking at a range of things that that may not move the needle very much. So if we think about things like uh, in, in those four categories, community, things like an aging population, changes in housing preference uh, in the economics area, economic growth uh, overall, as well as specific sectors. If you think about climate resiliency, think about localized flooding or changes in clean energy. Um, 
in terms of industry as well as policy, and then technology, different types of mobility on demand. Um, uh, another one that, that's been highlighted here is agricultural technology. That's changing already, but uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity for those, those types of things to, to move forward. And what's on the screen isn't everything. Uh, there's a whole matrix of possible future conditions that future forces of change that we're looking at. Uh, some of the things, uh, we have a, a uh, diverse steering committee that's been established um, that includes subject matter experts from all these different areas. And uh, what we've looked at so far is trying to, to look at these buckets of, of categories and, and start to add things in. Um, just to highlight a few things like under technology, um, other technology dynamics that, that may impact future conditions are broadband. I mean, that's being discussed now, but the availability of broadband that could change business patterns and, and development patterns. Um, uh, regional economy dynamics, things like tourism, um, sector growth, uh, workforce development, uh, telework, corporate culture, all those things are gonna impact future conditions. Uh, if you look under community, population dynamics, um, overall growth, uh, household composition, uh, locational preferences and housing preferences, uh, a lot of these things are, are, are uh, changing on, on, a, on a regular basis and we, we think that through these, the identification of these future changes, future forces of change, we can, we can build better predictors of, of what, the, what the future might hold. Um, I can't read it. Political dynamics? Yes. Um, does that include like war? It could. Uh, we're actually <laughs> we're developing one scenario that is uh, we're, we're we're calling it like the what if what if is there a war is there additional pandemic is there are those those kinds of things that would be major disruptors um, outside of just kind of regular um, growth. Because the health thing we talked yeah you know about COVID obviously absolutely there are a couple of other things coming down the road. There's yes. A fungus out there. Yes. That's sixty percent fail. That is that is part of the discussion. And they are looking into hospitals. Okay. I mean, really, really high. Because all the budgets I had seen up until COVID, they were like use nine eleven as their pivotal point. You know, if there's another nine eleven, you know, you know, two thousand one, nine eleven, two thousand one. Um, our budget would do this. And then we had COVID, which shrank even more, crashed even more. So I mean, we have to pick a few things that might really right. destroy the economy or whatever. Right. Okay. Really, really. Good. So where we are heading with this, um, towards the end of the project, uh, we want to be at a point where it's essentially a, a a tool that could be useful not just for for the folks around this table but other places other organizations and agencies where it's a, a set of sliders a dashboard if you will um, where you could say all right this condition this scenario we're thinking about that the population is going to be higher the economy is going to grow but um, we want to conserve land for development and uh, the climate will remain stable climate conditions will remain stable to today what are going, what's going to happen. And we'll be able to, to look at a, a range of different options and, and possible futures through this type of thing. The, the, what's on the screen is just an illustration. The, the, the actual tool will, will be different than this. Uh, and the ways we're moving forward with this is uh, we have three levels of engagement. Um, we are developing, we're actually getting ready to release a, uh, an initial uh, public survey online um, using uh, a very interactive platform. Um, we are uh, working to identify opportunities through the, the milestones of the planning process to interact with the public at events. So obviously as it warms up over the summer, uh, we're identifying ways to, to get out there and, and, and talk with people one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, we have a, a um, advisory committee uh, that uh, has been meeting now for, for a couple months. And then we are also working on supplemental opportunities to go out and talk to community groups, um, town halls, you know, organizations, uh, neighborhood groups, those kinds of things. 
and then um, we're, we'll be prepared to, to come back to this body with, with regular updates as long as we can fit it on the agenda. Um, and um, the breakdown, this is kind of exciting. The, the, the advisory committee that we've set up is a little bit different. Uh, this is a little bit different type of, of thought process. So we have people not just from transportation, we have land use planners from, from uh, the community. We have folks representing environmental agencies, emergency management, housing, energy, economic development, and community health. So uh, there's, a, there's a gentleman serving on the, the advisory committee from the National Weather Service. Uh, we have um, housing experts. We have uh, the, uh, the Virginia Health Department uh, sits on the, the advisory committee. And the, the primary purpose of, of what we have underway is to develop this suite of models. I think it's 11 different um, models that will help us predict what all of these possible changes will be making. Once this is complete, then we'll be able to turn our focus to how best to serve the community with the tools that's been developed. Uh, and that means working with you know economic development groups, chambers, um, environmental groups uh, to make sure that the, the data that's available and the, the, the outputs of the, the, the scenario planning tool are something that can be useful and, and, and uh, supportive of, of the community overall. The next steps, we are in uh, April. We, are, uh, we have scheduled our first um, uh, stakeholder charrette. There have been a, uh, we've identified about 100 people in the community um, that have a specific, um, uh, a specific focus that might serve the, the development of these models. Um, and they've been invited to the charrette at the end of April. Um, at the same time, we continue to work with our advisory committee uh, to, um, to move forward with, with the process of developing the tools. Um, and as I said, uh, depending on the season, We'll be able to be out in the community doing more work and and uh, talking with people about what we're developing and, and get feedback. Uh, but as I mentioned, the, the first part of this is really focusing on that technical goal of getting the getting the tool uh, put into place. Mr. Chair, that's all I have for the presentation. I'd be happy to take any questions. There is no action requested at this point. All right, all right. Information item. Any questions? I got a question. Yes, sir, Mr. Williams. Chad, you could say you all got 11 models? Yes. Okay, is this kind of like you know, right. when we have a hurricane come in where they give you the European model and they give you the US? <laughs> I mean, you know, where all of them track to a different, you know, place? Is that, is that? The, that's a great question. The models are really, uh, they all, the hard part is making the models talk to each other. So what are the inputs and outputs? But there's going to be there's a model specific to community health. There's a model specific to building emissions. There's a model specific to um, land use. Uh, that's that's the big connector for everything. Is is what are the what are the land use impacts of the other decisions that are being made? So all of those models are going to talk to each other and be able to provide the output in a way that is um, digestible for not just. The, the people that are developing the tool, but the general public. Has this been done someplace else in another region where they have a, a history of how well this has worked? It is not. We, we, are, we have not found another MPO that has undertaken an effort like this um, on the scale of, the, of this, this tool that reflects the same kind of thing. There are other MPOs that have done uh, a scenario planning project, but it was fully focused on transportation. Uh, if we were going to expend the budget on doing this, our goal was to provide a tool that is more useful for everybody. So if you have a, a, a land use planner in, in Powhatan County, we expect this to be just as useful for looking at, at uh, future land use categories and, and parcel uh, mapping <coughs> as it is for someone developing a, a traffic model. So all four categories will be integrated such that, you know, the output will reflect all the four different categories. Yes. So when you're going forward, how will you go back and check and see if the model is actually working? Are you going to do any type of 
each year, you know, like we're going through a budget, you know, Powhatan County, just like the other jurisdictions, and we're trying to predict what's going to happen next year. You're going up to 2050. What are you going to do in those intervening years to be able to go back and check? Is your model working? You know, as, as Mark Twain said, predicting is a difficult business, particularly when it comes to the future. So what are you going to do, you know, when this thing goes into place and then after year one, year five, are you going to do any types of adjustments based on experience? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, that's a great question. And, and one, we will adjust uh, the inputs um, as new data comes up, becomes available, whether that's that census updates or you know new housing numbers for the region, those types of things. We'll obviously be able to fine tune. But yes, uh, it's it's a continuously evolving um, process. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Any other questions? Yeah, well, just one last. What type of um, input are you going to get for this reference trip generations and what type of traffic studies input are you going to try and get for from the different jurisdictions we'll be in Riker, Richmond, Chester, Hanover, 95, 64, 288, whatever, because I think those traffic numbers are going to be important for this model. So, I mean, how is that going to work? Is it going to be a request that you make the VDOT to get the information from them? Uh, or are you going to hit the localities up to find out what type of studies they've done? How is that input going to be brought in? That's a great question, Mr. Carroll. Um, one, uh, a model, models like this are only as good as the information that goes in. So mm -hmm. we want to understand what's on the ground right now to start, to, to set that foundation. But then through our, our existing travel demand model, as well as hopefully this a new transit model, we'll be able to, <coughs> to uh, work directly with the localities, I think primarily, as well as VDOT, to understand new developments, new projects, uh, the things that are that are uh, down the road, so that we can understand where that demand is going to be, not just for you know a, a, an arterial or a, or, a, or a highway or a new transit route, but where's the where are the new units going to be in terms of housing and, and employment numbers and where those things are going to happen and uh, to Mr. Williams' question, that'll that'll continue to evolve when new information comes out. But it's going to be on us as staff to con to have those lines of communication open and make sure that we understand from each jurisdiction what the best information available is going to be. Um, yes, ma'am. Uh, for air budget in Henrico, we do a, for years. We've had trends. It's a book we book that we put out. And of course, it, it, it has certain issues like population changes, age and whatever grows, and, and um, it's all based um, on a lot of things that it comes down to how what we predict for the coming year. Uh, the trends right now are heavily saying that we're going to have a big recession over the course of the next 12 months. So we have planned for the worst, I mean, planned for a lot for thinking in terms of recession, but we're hoping for the best. But my point there is, how about a trends book? Is there a trends book available for transportation? We have some of that in the trends book, but not, it's not because of that, it's for budget planning. So it's a trends, you know, po between population jobs, ages, everything. It's, it's got niche today. And we, we, you can sit there and flip through it and see what's happened in the last at least 10 years, I think. And the lines will go up and down, and you'll say, okay, that was 2020. Yeah. A lot of people have done We've done a lot of that already. So it's like a trends book or a book about trends. That's what, when you say predicting the future, that would be without a base on. That's what we always think. Right. About that? Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Chair, the two big building blocks uh, for this, as well as our long range transportation plan, our population and employment. And we just finished, um, we have a, a socioeconomic data committee, and uh, we just finished updating those numbers um, for the year 2050 um, in, in anticipation of the next long range planning cycle. So, yes, uh, to, to Ms. Bannon's question, those are the, the two big trends on, on what, what are the changes in population employment and where is that going to happen? So that's a building block for this, as well as, as some of the other projects. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. We do ours. It's got all other kinds of things. 
because it's budget bonds, bonds and stocks. I mean, how have they got things that you wouldn't think about for a local government? Because you're trying, you really are trying. To just thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Carroll. Did you get your question answered? Thank you. Yep. I have um, some information I'll provide them later. Good. Yeah, I think it sounds like the key is communication with localities, which you're building that in. If we're done with that, we'll roll into agent, agency and committee report, CTAC report. Thank you, Ms. Guthrie, for uh, joining us today. And, and we have in, we have the uh, memorandum in our packet from your March 16th meeting. You got a general assembly update, it sounds like. And then I think we all probably noticed the um, bike walk RBA, the disturbing, not, uh, disturbing sad trend in Virginia and in the region on pedestrian fatalities. Uh, but uh, give us any, any update in addition to what's in the memo. Well, the memo didn't reflect the discussion we had about participating in the next meeting. So that's why I raised that earlier. So right, I'll, I'll right. get with Chad and we'll figure out maybe a invite people to come to the full meeting and then we'll have likely have our full meeting after the policy board meeting so we'll um, we'll ask for a commitment for a full day from a number of um, representatives good well, looking forward to that yeah that's all right yeah, that, that's that's all you have is that everything yes yeah, thank, thank you transportation agency updates mr parsons uh, cvta Thank you. On page 28 in the packet is a, a summary from February 24th of the, 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 the full authority meeting um, through March. Uh, the Fallen Working Group, Finance Committee, and the Technical Advisor Committee have met. Um, we had a, uh, our, we expect the, the, the TAC and the Finance Committee to meet again next week, uh, leading up to uh, a full authority meeting again at the end of April. Um, I think the biggest thing to to highlight here is that um, the fall line trail continues to move forward and uh, working to put things in place and, and I think most notably um, we know, we've been working on a series of agreements um, so that funding can start to be, be distributed for, for immediate needs. Uh, we are now in, I, I would say, uh, the exciting time of the authority where uh, we're actually going to be sending out regional funds for, for projects to be to be undertaken, and the first step is is a an agreement between the CBTA and, and localities that are going to administer uh, funds locally. Um, and we have an agreement in place, a template that can be used um, in, in conjunction with with other agreements that have already been adopted, so that projects can start moving forward. And we we, we expect to have those those uh, kicking off. Uh, over the next few months, so uh, I, I would encourage anyone who's interested to to stay tuned for for, for new projects using uh, CBTA leverage dollars. Any questions on that, Mr. Carroll? Anything to add from CBTA? Uh, no, we still got more to go over here, so we'll let the meeting move forward. <laughs> yeah. GRTC, Ms. Adams. Good morning, Mr. Chair. I'm going to allow Ms. Torres to provide okay. an update on her projects. I think it's uh, some planning effort projects that I'll provide updates on. Um, our North-South BRT, we are uh, deep in the analysis phase right now and setting up um, some additional stakeholder meetings. So you should see meetings for stakeholder and kind of pop up public events happening in April and May. Um, our transit strategic plan, we also kicked that off um, and that is going to be a regional coordinated effort basically over the next six to ten years what are our planning efforts um, with a constrained and unconstrained piece of that, looking at GRTC um, internally, strategically, as well as our plans um, with the region. So all the conversations we've had before, we wanna look at it from several modes, how we can work together. Um, and there will be stakeholder and pop-up and community events with that. And we're also doing an origin and destination survey that should be happening in the next couple of weeks. Um, which is actually getting information from riders on the bus um, to see their perspective on things. Uh, the last one I'm just going to touch lightly just to give uh, what we've been doing with the micro transit. We have had um, two meetings, I think, since I introduced last with um, the jurisdictions, which have been really great with zone refinement. Uh, and we're having another one with them and consultants this coming week. Um, we've already made some shifts based on feedbacks from um, like the nonprofit agencies, those who are already um, delivering similar services. Um, so that has been, been really good. Uh, and we're doing a parallel effort for our communication plan. So we'll be working with the jurisdictions on that to get that in. 
Thank you. Thank you. Um, DRPT. Thank you. So I'm going to highlight a couple of updates. First of all, this month we will be starting our Discover Transit campaign. Um, we are hosting a webinar later this afternoon that will highlight some of the elements of that marketing campaign, including um, kind of co-branding opportunities, media placements throughout the Commonwealth. Um, but this will be sort of our kickoff for the next couple months in terms of trying to get more engagement back into transit. Um, we do all have some resources that are available and there's a contact for one of our communications team staff if you have an interest in trying to get some of the marketing materials related to the campaign. Um, just kind of other notes, we are um, currently underway as we just had a discussion about UPWPs for our FY24 Section 5303 funding. Um, we receive applications from all of our MPOs and that will be due as of May 1st. Um, we are also um, trying to navigate some modifications that came out due to some dear colleague letters from FTA regarding some waivers um, related to 5303 funding. So we hope to have some information out to our MPOs within the next week. Um, that will allow them to be able to take advantage of applying for some waivers on non-federal match that are um, related to both complete streets as well as some eligible activities related to low po population density as well as low average income. Um, so there's a lot of information that had come out within the end of March um, that we are trying to be able to respond to and allow our MPOs to take advantage of ahead of the um, upcoming fiscal year. The last item I wanted to note is that there is a new funding opportunity that came out. It's called the Charging and Fueling Infrastructure Discretionary Grant Program. I know as a body we have discussed about electrification and alternative fuels, um, and this is something that's eligible for MPOs to apply for. Um, this focuses on um, strategically deploying publicly accessible electric vehicle charging and alternative fuel infrastructure in places where people live and work. Um, this is also along designated alternative fuel corridors, which are identified through some various planning efforts. Um, so the program has two funding categories that are community charging and fueling grants or alternative fuel corridor grants. Um, so the bipartisan infrastructure law provides about 2.5 billion over the next five years for this program. And the applications may be submitted um, up until May 30th. So I did provide information that I will give in my agency update, but I do always want to try to encourage some opportunities in terms of the future planning efforts, and I know that there's a lot of interest in that. And that is all I have for my agency update. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Okay. What'd you say the deadline? May 30th. May 30th. Not like we don't have a lot of other things to do. <laughs> yeah. any, any questions? Uh, so far, all right. Mr. Cotton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, everybody. A couple of items to highlight uh, from last month's CTB meeting, the March meeting. Uh, there was one action item related to the Richmond District, uh, specifically uh, the, re the commemorative naming of the U.S. Route 60 Midlothian Turnpike bridges over Route 288 are now formally the Special Agent Michael T. Walter Memorial Bridge uh, bridges. Uh, you may remember Special Agent Walter was a veteran of the United States Marine Corps, served for 18 years with Virginia State Police before his untimely death in the line of duty in May of 2017. Uh, this uh, this uh, commemorative naming was sponsored by the Virginia State Police. Uh, we expect to, to be undertaking that, uh, that effort to hang the signs in the very near future. Uh, just wanted you to be aware of that, just if you happen to be out in that portion of Chesterfield County, headed to towards Powhatan, perhaps, uh, you might see that. Um, just be advised that we have scheduled our six-year plan public hearing, um, as it happens in the spring most years. It is scheduled for Monday, April 24th. It will be at the Richmond District, uh, what we call the JSOC, or our new district office, uh, beginning at 4 p.m. Uh, that is uh, an annual event, so please be advised of, of that schedule. Um, Notification should have gone out uh, to those logical recipients yesterday. Just a quick update uh, before I finish, um, give you an update on uh, the fall line trail um, design build package one, which is essentially the, the portion, the area from uh, town of Ashland limits down towards the Henrico County line. We did receive favorable bids uh, last month and we are uh, intend to move forward with uh, award uh, this spring. Uh, so construction should begin uh, later this summer on that segment. We also are continuing to work on design build segment two, which is at the southern end in Chesterfield County. Uh, our survey work and uh, initial engineering work is underway. We expect to have the uh, 
advertisements for the request for proposals in late 2023. That's my report, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Be glad to answer any questions. Mr. Todd. Any, any questions for Mr. Todd? All right. Um, Mr. Chair, I have a question. Yes. Um, I 64. Okay. Sure. So we are moving. I, I should have had that on there. We are moving forward with three offerers for the first segment. At this point, we are uh, in the um, request for a formal proposal stage at this point. Uh, and uh, we expect to have a successful outcome for that with the first segment going under contract uh, towards the end of this year. Um, so we are uh, headed down that direction at this point. Um, the hope would be that uh, as the first uh, segment, which is the segment um, in your neighborhood, Ms. Page, as, as that is going to uh, be under contract, we will then shortly thereafter move forward with the uh, opposite end uh, and get that, that procurement started uh, early next year. So we'll be moving forward with the second phase and the third phase will follow uh, shortly thereafter. So making progress. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, yes, ma'am. Um, all right, anything else? So uh, future meeting topics are, are see that on the agenda. There's uh, May 4th is, is packed, as we've been saying, and I, I will do my best to try to start us on time and, and follow some time frames. I may be a little tougher on, on the timing than typically just to try to keep us moving along. We do have a lot to cover. And Ms. Guthrie, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to get with Mr. Parsons and, and and, and you and kind of coordinate how we can utilize your all's participation. The Just best. reiterate, it's the 18th, right? And that, and it is the 18th. That, that, that's the that's the main takeaway when you look at future meeting topics. That says May 4th, but as you all know, we we are May 18th. We're meeting here. Then then we're going to have the joint annual meeting with Plan RBA, a CBTA, and this body on June 1st, and that is going to be here. Um, so the time will sail away we're going to be in the summer before we know it but uh, we'll certainly work to have a productive and, and successful may meeting and thank you all for your participation today um, is there any other member comments are there any other member comments <coughs> june 1st here that's the joint meeting are there any other uh, comments from members then we, we will adjourn now to our May 18th meeting here. Thank you all again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.